You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is a new month, and that means that it is time for Searching Scripture in the September issue of The Lutheran Witness. Can you believe Mm. it's September already? No, not at all. (laughs) (laughs) Kiddo's back to school. We are going to study God's Word in 1 Peter chapter 3 today. Pastor Roth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today for Searching Scripture in the Coffee Hour in the September issue of The Lutheran Witness. That's a lot of names, a lot of titles. It is. The Reverend (laughs) Carl Roth of Grace Lutheran Church in Elgin, Texas. Pastor Roth, welcome back. Delighted to be with you again. We are in 1 Peter, continuing our study in 1 Peter today with chapters 3 and part of chapter 4. You want to bring us into the text, give us the, the text we're reading and and, and dig into Let, it. Let's jump right in. All right. So this is 1 Peter 3, 18 through 4, 6. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. So far, our text. Mm. What would you like to start with <laughs> first, Pastor? Yeah, so I can, I can, you know, I, I don't know if if our um, audience knows, but we can see each other, and I see, I see Andy and Sarah scratching their heads right now. Yeah. So this is this is a difficult section. There's there's two particularly difficult passages in here, but I actually don't think that that they're they're too hard once you once you approach the scriptures from a rather simple and scripture interprets scripture perspective the first challenging text in in here refers to the part where where Christ descended and and preached to the spirits in prison and i would ask the simple question what else could this refer to other than Christ's victorious descent into hell to proclaim defeat over sin satan and the enemies of god how else could you possibly explain it you know, that's one way of looking at it. We don't have a lot of time today, but I do encourage you to consult your Lutheran study Bible on this. We say in the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell. That's something that we oftentimes, you know, when we're teaching confirmation students or teaching people in adult instruction, people are really perplexed by this. In fact, some, I'd, I'd call them uh, progressive denominations today, have actually rewritten that part of the creed because they don't want to deal with it and they don't want to think about it, but it's actually quite comforting. And I would point out that our Lutheran Book of Concord actually deals with this. The descent of Christ into hell is Article 9 of the Formula Concord. And there were some disputes at the time of the Reformation about this. And I'll just read a couple of sentences from the Formula Concord, the official position of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, by the way, that, that help us to approach this text and, and this doctrine with, sim- with childlike simplicity. It says, this article cannot be grasped by the senses or by our reason. It must be grasped through faith alone. Therefore, it is our unanimous unanimous opinion that there should be no dispute about it. It should be believed and taught only in the simplest way. Teach it like Dr. Luther of blessed memory in his sermon at Torgau in the year of 1533. So Luther 
you can actually go read that sermon. It's available online and in Luther Luther's works. And it's it's a it's a wonderful teaching. It's a wonderful sermon about the victory of Christ over the devil and how that's the reason he descends into hell, to proclaim victory over sin, death, Satan, and hell, so that we know that in Christ Jesus, our Lord, we have the victory. And that's the simplest way to explain it, and that's what's going on in this text as well. So what do you, you want me to move on to the next challenging doctrine in here? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, let's get that out of the way before we go into our questions. Okay, so in 1 Peter 4, 6, it talks about the gospel being preached to those who are, are dead, and that sounds to us like, well, does that mean that people like have a second chance or something? But this one is scripture interprets scripture. Hebrews 9 says it's appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. So those who are dead here in 1 Peter 4, 6 has to be a reference to those who are dead in sin. As Ephesians 2, 1 puts it, we're born dead, basically, right? Born dead in trespasses and sins. And so the gospel is preached to, to sinners who are truly dead and under the condemnation, who will face eternal death if they do not hear the gospel and are resurrected. So I think this one's actually a, even simpler and more straightforward. Fantastic. Now that we've cleared those up, <laughs> shall we dive into the questions in the Lutheran Witness? Let's do it. All right. Question number one. What does it mean for us that Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous? First Peter 3, verse 18. See First Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5, and Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. Yeah, so there's actually two angles that you can um, approach this text from. When, when we talk about Christ suffering for sins, it, it's it, it, it's basically that he suffers the consequences that we deserve for our sins, and he, and he steps in and takes the punishment for us. So there's two subtle, slight differences there, but it's, it's two sides of the same coin. In 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, where St. Paul tells us that, that Christ died for our sins, and in Romans 6, we're told that Christ suffered and, and died for the ungodly, for sinners, and and he actually suffered the wrath of God so that we can be saved from that wrath. So Christ vicariously steps into our place and suffers for us, and then he also suffers the consequences of what we deserve. So this leads then to the great blessed exchange that Christ steps into the place we deserve to go so that we, he, he basically suffers hell so that we can go to heaven. His he suffers the wrath of God so that we can receive the grace of God. And then we could list all these beautiful exchanges of the gospel for, for hours and hours. But it, it is wonderful good news that we get uh, right off the right from the outset in this, this passage today. All right. Question two. While we are curious to know more about Christ's descent into hell than 1 Peter 3.19 tells us, why do, we, why do we know so much more about his resurrection than his descent in hell? See Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Yeah, so oops. St. Luke begins the second part of his work. He wrote the gospel according to St. Luke, and then Acts 1 begins, In the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Notice he started doing and teaching. Now he's going to continue doing and teaching in the book of Acts. Until the day he, when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the visible proof and evidence that he, is con he has conquered sin, death, and hell. I would say that his descent into hell and his resurrection are two sides of the same coin. We can't see the descent into hell side, right? He does this, but it's the same coin. And that is the victory coin. Jesus Christ wins, defeats the devil, proclaims victory over the devil. After he's been, you know, after his body's been revivified, he descends into hell, body and soul, proclaims victory over Satan. But then he comes out victoriously from the grave. And the New Testament places the emphasis on the public, visible evidence of, of his victory and the fact that the apostles in the book of Acts are witnesses of that. So there's something mysterious and hidden and known only to God 
about what happens in the descent, it's sufficient for us to know that it happened. Whereas the resurrection is necessary for us to actually have evidence for, right? This has to be something witnessed and seen here on earth. Question three. What set Noah and his family apart from the rest of humans at the time of the flood? See Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8, and Hebrews 11, verse 7. In Matthew 24, verses 36 through 39, what does Jesus teach Christians through the story of Noah? All right. So I think we're tempted to say Noah was just a lot, you know, better of a guy than the rest of humanity. And, you know, we just don't actually know exactly how he behaved on a day to day basis. In Genesis 6, we see that the Lord looked down at the earth and saw that every, the intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. The Lord regretted that he had made man. It grieved him. So he said, I'm going to wipe him out. And then in verse 8, we're told, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now, finding favor, uh, another word for favor is grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so it's not that Noah is this super awesome hero of the faith at that point this point at least. I mean, he does, he is held up as a year of the faith, but, but at this, you know, it's not any merit or worthiness in Noah that causes God to choose him. God chooses to basically restart the world from Noah and his family. And that is all by grace. That is by his favor. And, and just as Mary was the one chosen by grace to bear the, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, not because of any merit or worthiness in her, so also Noah. Now, what happens when we come to faith? The Holy Spirit fills our hearts and we bear good fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. So Hebrews 11 says that Noah, by faith, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So Noah does. His faith is active, living, busy. We do see a, a difference in Noah after he, after God finds favor with him from the rest of humanity. He is the one who prepares and listens to the word of the Lord. So also for all of us, it's not because of any merit or worthiness in us, purely by God's grace and favor that we become children of God. And then we bear good fruit by following in the faithful footsteps of people like Noah. Now, Jesus also uses the example of Noah and, and the entering of the ark as a way of preparing us for the end of time. Life has this humdrum quality about it that, you know, we figure everything's just going to kind of keep going the way it has. But in fact, Jesus warns that the day of the, the last day is going to be like the way it was for those outside the ark who weren't prepared. It's going to come upon them suddenly and catch them off guard. So Jesus uses this, this, this narrative to remind us to be prepared and watchful and ready. And because we're baptized into Christ, we are ready to meet him and eager to meet him. We are searching scripture in 1 Peter chapter 3 and 4 today from the September issue of The Lutheran Witness with Pastor Carl Roth. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are searching scripture in the September issue of The Lutheran Witness. Our guest today, Pastor Carl Roth of Grace Lutheran Church in Elgin, Texas. We are in 1 Peter chapter 3 and 4. All right, Pastor, you ready for question number 4? Let's do it. Baptism now saves you. That's a reference from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, is a verse that people who reject the efficacy of baptism cannot explain away. How do Mark 16, verse 16, and Titus 3, verse 5, Acts chapter 2, verses, verse 38, and Colossians 2, verses 12 through 14 also support the truth that baptism saves? 
All right. First, I got to tell a little story about this passage. Nice. We used to have a church sign that we would change every week. And now it actually just says Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we did a permanent kind of fixed sign. But it used to be one we changed every week. And I put up there, 1 Peter 3, 21, baptism now saves you one time. And I got a voicemail at church from this guy who said, that sign is absolutely wrong. Baptism does not save you. It simply symbolizes or signifies uh, that we're saved by our act of obedience to the Lord, which is what baptism is. And so that really, um, we're right off of a major highway there. And so I, I got that guy riled up pretty good about it. So anyway, this is a passage, though, that that people that oppose baptismal regeneration just really can't explain away. It says baptism now saves you. In Mark 16, Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. Titus 3 says, God saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal. Acts 2, Peter says that if you're baptized, you receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And where there's forgiveness of sins, there's also life and salvation. And Colossians 2 says that we've been buried with Christ in baptism, in which, that is in baptism, we were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So today we glory in our baptism, not that it just simply symbolizes or signifies our salvation, but that it actually affects our salvation. Baptism now saves you. And notice the present tense there. Baptism now saves you. It daily and richly you know, works forgiveness of sins and rescues from death and the devil. The Holy Spirit is at work for your baptism continuously. Are there, is there a symbol involved in baptism? In fact, there is part four of the small catechism in baptism. What does baptizing signify or indicate? It indicates that we're to drown our old Adam and rise up to newness of life. So there is symbolism in baptism. We should be thinking about it continuously, but above all, we should be rejoicing in what it gives, life and salvation. Question five, how does 1 Peter 3 verse 22 relate to our earlier discussion of Christ's descent into hell? Also see Luke 4 verses 1 through 13, 11 verses 14 through 23, and Colossians 2 verse 15. Uh, so just to remind you, 1 Peter three twenty two says that Christ has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. You know, this is a, a reference back to what Jesus does on the cross in taking the punishment for our sins and removing the grounds upon which Satan could accuse us, right? He can't accuse us any longer because Christ answered for our sins. And then he's He's shown victory over the, the bad angels, the authorities, and the powers of hell by descending into hell and proclaiming the victory. So Jesus has, has a, this, a, this is another passage that really deals with the same theme of the descent into hell. And Luke 4 is the narrative of Jesus being tempted by the devil in the wilderness and using the word of God to conquer him. So that's another passage, I think, that we should which refer to when we're thinking about how has he conquered the devil. Likewise, in Luke 14, Jesus talks about how he has defeated the strong man, the devil, plundered him and taken us away from the power of the devil so that we now belong to him. And a wonderful passage, Colossians 2.15 says, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. God has done that in Christ. So first, first Peter 3.22 and the earlier passage about the descent into hell all help us to revel in the fact that as we sing in, a, in, in God's own child, I gladly say it, you know, Satan can no longer accuse us, right? He has no more power over us. Hmm. All right. Question six, read first Peter chapter four, verses one to two, alongside Galatians two, verse 20, five, verse 24, and six, verse 14. How do these verses portray our Christian lives as those who live in the world, but not of it? All right, I'll reread those passages because it's been a few minutes. First Peter 4, 1 and 2. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And I'll read these, these three passages from Galatians. 
2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 5.24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 6.14, but, uh, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So we can recognize that there's a union between us and Christ. We've been crucified with him in our, him in our baptism. You know, his suffering becomes our suffering, and then we take up our cross each day and follow. What this pa these passages also show us is there's going to be a battle going on inside of us. Our old sinful flesh is going to continue to try to drag us back into fidelity to the devil, into sin. But the fact that Christ lives in us, and also, so he's provided us an example, and he also continues to live in us, he is going to give us the strength to overcome and win the victory in our own lives, in our own Christian lives. And, and so the world, what the world does or thinks doesn't really make much difference to us because we know that in Jesus Christ, the world has been crucified to us and we to the world. Question seven, read 1 Peter 4, verse three. Why do you think Gentiles, non-Christians, often live licentious lives? See Ephesians 2, verse 12, and 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 5 and 13. All right. So 1 Peter 4, 3, for the time that is past is suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. You know, there's a Psalm 84 says, I would rather be a, a, a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And there's this retired pastor in my congregation who says sometimes, yeah, but you know, I'd kind of like to peek inside the tents of the wicked occasionally. And I think what you'd see inside the, the tents of the wicked is actually the, this list of things that are going on here, right? And our old sinful flesh is tempted towards these lascivious things, right? But Peter actually points out, look, these things are, are going to end nowhere but the grave. And, and Ephesians 2 says, Paul reminds Christians who had been caught up in similar things, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You know, for those who have no hope, no, no, no future, right? I, all there is is this life. I'm just in this flesh sack. And, you know, I'm, I mean, uh, there's no there's no resurrection of the body and the life everlasting at death. That's all there is. There's no hope there. So it's the promise of the resurrection and life everlasting that gives Christians meaning and purpose and, and hope for the future. And it also, Jesus Christ's resurrection is how we know God is with us. Behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So I can, I can see how people who do not believe in Christ can fall into the temptation of these things because they don't think their bodies make any difference and they think might as well just enjoy life as much as possible because eat, drink, and be merry, tomorrow you'll be dead. And First Thessalonians 4 also contrasts the life of the Christian with the life of Gentiles. Paul says Gentiles live in the passion of lust because they don't know God, whereas we've been called upon to control our bodies, to abstain from sexual immorality, and to live in holiness and honor. And, and he reminds us again and again, always takes us back to the resurrection. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. We don't have to even grieve over the, our, our beloved, those who have died in Christ, because we know that we will see them again and we'll be reunited. And so we don't have to drink away our sorrows or live it up. We can actually live according to the Lord of the Lord and, and trust that we'll be blessed through the doing of those words. Question eight. Why does God continue to have the gospel preached to those who are dead in sin? First Peter chapter four, verse six. See Peter, see Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine, and First Timothy two one to six. So we established that those who are dead in sin are still alive physically, right, in this world. So it's a spiritual death. So they need to be brought alive through the gospel and through holy baptism. And so this is a great question for us to end on because we know the the Lord's word has been sent out to reach as many people as possible. 
Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So why does the Lord keep having us preach the gospel even when it doesn't seem like people are listening? Because he wants everyone out there to reach repentance. Jesus Christ died for all, and that's what First Peter 2 says. There's one mediator, there's one redeemer, one go between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and he gave himself as a ransom for all. And Paul tells us in in 1 Timothy 2 that God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so that's why we publish the Lutheran Witness. That's why KFUO continues to proclaim the gospel through the airwaves. That's why pastors like me keep getting up in the pulpit, because we want this saving gospel to be to reach as many people as possible. Our guest today, the Reverend Carl Roth, Grace Lutheran Church, Elgin, Texas, helping us in searching scripture in the September issue of the Lutheran Witness. Pastor Roth, thanks so much for your great work on this Bible study and for unpacking it for us today. It's a pleasure as always. Thank you. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.